Good morning, I am Jim, and you are well aware of this because you've been hopefully watching my stuff all week. Uh, this is Ryan. Hello. And together we write TPK, one of the blogs attached to Woodsuit Riot. Uh, we blog about D&D &D and gaming and history. GMing and history and storytelling and psychology and all kinds of random things as, as they associate to tabletop gaming. Whatever we can throw in there, it sticks. Pretty much. So, everybody knows about me, and they know that I make random things, and start stuff, and I'm addicted to collaboration, and I like making music noises with my face. But you guys don't know him, so talk about yourself. You'll recognize his face from the top of our channel. The beard is slightly less full at the moment, but yeah, well, it is we perfect. No, he's perfect. Well, you can try. Same thing. That's nice. You think that. Yeah. Well, I am Ryan. Uh, you may have seen some of my posts on TPK if you read it. Uh, if not, you should. True fact. Um, I am a... I am in between grad studies at the moment. Uh, I just finished my master's in classical studies, and I am now going to be pursuing my PhD in classical studies in the fall, uh, because apparently I don't want to have degrees that lead to careers, so I just thought I'd pile them together like that. Uh, other than that, I... That's a good question. Yeah. Well, I do gaming stuff. I tricked both. him into writing for my blog. He did. Uh, that was a very good trick. Sometimes I think he regrets it, but... I never regret it. Occasionally regret it. Literally. I'm sometimes tardy, as with the aforementioned grad studies. Yeah. Well, uh, it's grad school. What are you going to do? Yeah. Theses take up a lot of time. No, I've been running uh, role-playing games for about 20 years now. I started with a tiny paperback, Dark Sword Adventures, and I played a lot of D&D and uh, Vampire and stuff like that. And then I studied it in grad school, and I formalized it, and I started doing more game studies in my off hours and game design. And I l I'm really passionate about... Oh, I hate that word, passion. I really wish I could edit that out, but I'm not going to. I just, I, I have this terrible relationship with that word. But I, I love talking about ways that we can game better. And there are lots. And not just ways that you can game better, but ways that I can game better. Half the stuff, half the advice I give is stuff I've caught myself doing numerous times. Most of the stuff I write about is from the problems that I have encountered thus far. Yeah, you've been running your... So I run a 3.5 game that I live stream, which you will find here every couple weeks uh, when I'm not traveling. Um, I also run a D&D Next game that Ryan plays in, which you will occasionally hear about. Um, and Ryan, you run an... I run a 4th Ed Essentials game. Uh, mostly just the Essentials part, uh, as I wanted something very simple to start with as my first run as a GMing. Uh, because this is the first game I've ever run. Uh, and it is almost a year old. It will be in a few months. Oh, yeah, it is. I tricked Ryan into playing D&D &D about three years ago, and now he's stuck. Now I can't get enough of it. So I have much less experience than Jim. But uh, I tend to have that nerd obsession level about things, so I delve in pretty deeply when I go for things. And now... One of the things I want to do, we're, I, I actually want to do this, uh, Ryan doesn't know this, but I want to do this twice in this episode. Um, he's, he's tricking me already. Yeah, I do that. That's how I roll. Generally, I am duplicitous. It's probably not actually true, but... Um, it's like 50% true? Yeah. Um, 60? Soon it will be August 2nd, which is International Crack a Pack Day. And I just got back into Magic the Gathering. I bought a Dragon's Maze event deck after playing a ton of it at a conference. I hadn't played in 20 years since it first came out, but it was so much fun. I've been watching some Magic videos online and sort of getting back into it. And I thought, International Crack-A-Pack Day, we should crack a pack. So each of us are going to crack a pack. And look at it. This is the first booster pack I have ever opened in my life. Even when I played 20 years ago, when I was 10 years old, I did not buy any booster packs on account of I was 10 years old. And 10-year-olds back then didn't have any money. And when I was a 10-year-old playing this, I did have money. I just spent it all on, well, 
magic cards, as you do. Now, I... The first thing I notice about this pack is that there's no land in it. That's weird to me. But also, more importantly, um, normally when you see magic podcasts and that kind of thing, and I want to talk a little bit more about Magic the Gathering on the... Yeah, those are super cool. I got one of those too. Maybe two. Um, okay, I'm going to have to talk about this one in a second. But. Yeah. But normally on Magic Podcasts, they'll, they'll crack the pack, and they review all the cards in it, and they talk about the strengths and weaknesses. Well, we're not going to do that, and that's partly because I don't really know anything about enough about Magic to talk about it confidently, and Ryan... I am even less confident in my position about Magic. Uh, I have watched a few Magic things recently, uh, and I have established that what I knew back when I was 10 to 13, let's say has absolutely no relevance anymore. But I still love this game. So what I want to do is take these two packs and shuffle them together. I will shuffle this time. And we will deal out three cards and make an adventure hook. Spontaneous creativity. We just opened these packs. We have no way of knowing what's inside them, except for the look that we the brief look that we just got. I'm doing my best to shuffle them for real and not fake magic trick shuffle them. So he does that sometimes by accident. Yeah, it, no, it's a thing. Um, how do we want to do this? We want to deal out three cards th from the top, or do we want to cut? Oh, uh, from the top. All right, we've got. That was totally, totally planned. I didn't. Oh, this is some good stuff. This is some good stuff. We've got riot control, which gain life from some things. Uh, we've got deputy of acquittals which is a 2-2 two, two for 2, which I understand is pretty good. And we have something called Crypt Incursion, which exiles some stuff, and you gain 3 life for exiling them. That seems very nice. Yeah, I don't actually know. I like have I said, no idea. We don't know how these work. Um, but what we are going to do with them is create an adventure hook. Ryan, you can start. Okay. Well... Uh, the uh, Deputy of Acquittals approaches the party as they're resting from one of their adventures. Who is the day. Deputy of Acquittals? The Deputy of Acquittals is, uh, is a woman by the name of... Zanzibar. I was going to go with Asha, but Zanzibar, that works too. Uh, her, na her name is Zanzibar, and she approaches the party... Uh, because there has been some issue with uh, unrest in the city lately, and they're looking for a little outside assistance to keep things in control. They are the riot control, oh, if you very will. Very nice, very nice. Uh, to keep things under wraps and make sure nothing happens. And uh, while the party is inquiring about this, as they likely will, uh, unless you have an extremely mercenary party who just go, hey, we're getting paid to corral some villagers? Sure. Yeah. Which they occasionally will. Uh, they find out that the uh, uh, the bureaucracy in the town is messing around with something. Uh, they're going into the crypts. They're making incursions into them, if you will. The bureaucracy is making an incursion into the crypts? Well, certain members okay. of the bureaucracy. That sounds dangerous. Yeah, it's not really recommended, but, you know, they heard there's some good stuff down there. Okay. Where's the hook? I like where you're going with this. I mean, this is this is this is you've got your deputy of acquittals, who's your who's your person who hooks them into everything, and your riot control, which is your lead, and your crypt incursion, which is your finale. But I think is your, your goal is to get the party down to the crypt, right? That would be the goal. Yeah. Uh, us or have a giant riot that they have to encounter, uh, which then they find out it was about this crypt. Uh, sometimes it's nice to. You know, pull the rug out like that. They kill a bunch of villagers trying to keep them together, keep everything that in is order. terrible riot control. I'm not saying they're going to... Who are your party members? The LAPD? Have you ever, you know, ran with any party in any Dungeons & Dragons group? Would any of them actually be good at riot control? Yes. I your band authority. doesn't count. No, no. I... 
I can think of a couple. You know, you get a lot of entangled spells and crowd control. Oh, no, I'm not saying they don't have the capabilities to be very good riot control. But no, that's riot control without murdering people. Anyway, um, when I look at these, I, I, I like that. I like the bit with the, the deputy of acquittals at the beginning. But I want to put the deputy of acquittals at the end. Um, and the, I want to do it all backwards, actually, because you're going to have the party um, coming out of a crypt incursion. I mean, which I guess would be technically a crypt excursion, but who's counting? And you get them to come out, and they come out in the middle of town, out of a small mausoleum, to find riots in the streets. Getting mixed up in that, they wind up in front of the deputy of acquittals, who is like a local magistrate. And they, ha they, they, they are compelled in some way to perform a service... Or offered, or, or offered time served to perform to perform a service. Um, nothing too strenuous. I mean, we don't want to get into railroady stuff. But, and and you know, have some kind of lead in to that. And uh, I want to draw another card to finish it off. Am I allowed to? We just made this game up, so uh, we don't really have rules. I'll allow it. All right. And they wind up aw for the guilds. So the Deputy of Acquittals is corrupt and is in the service of the guilds and thus they must, they, they must, they can't just win the deputy's favor to free them or their friends who were involved in the riot. They have to awe the guilds. Very sort of Morrowind theme, I feel like. Very much. Anyway. I don't know what the theme or the story behind this particular, uh expansion or whatever you call different magic things is. Um, Dragon's Maze is all about uh, I think it's the, the city of Ravnica and beyond that I don't I'll be honest I don't know much about it uh, there's something about guilds of Ravnica yes there are, there are all kinds of guilds and houses in uh, in Dragon's Maze and Gate Crash and Return to Ravnica which I believe is a third part in that I think the technical term is block we seriously don't know anything about magic, but I do know a few things about telling stories. I do like doing that with cards, even though you're not supposed to do it with magic cards. Uh, but all we really wanted to talk about today, since this month on TPK it's opposite month, I will be writing all of Ryan's history posts. Ryan will be writing all of my GMing posts. Um, so this is just our introductory podcast to get to know you, get to know us, uh, I want to hear about your games. I love hearing and watching yes. other people play D&D. &D. I would love to hear, uh, for those of you who read TPK, tell me about something that you like in history. Uh, even if you don't read it, just tell me something like that. I'd love to just take those little aspects that people like and see if I can get a game hook out of them. Yeah. Uh, and you'd be amazed how easy it is to do once you just start working with it. Uh, a history book is actually a better uh, adventure guide than almost anything you can pick up uh, officially made, if you just use your imagination a little bit. I used to run a D&D game for five historians, and uh, they would continually tell me that everything that I that I had done, every every plot, every subplot, every every adventure they had participated in, they're like, the Roman Empire did this first. <laughs> and I don't feel like that's fair, because the Roman Empire did pretty much everything first and had like seven years to do it in. Uh, longer. Like, more, I, I know, I know, I know, I know. Quite a bit longer, actually. Yeah, I, mean, I, it's, I, was, I was thinking it's more like 12. Um, it's like 800 years if you just go with, like, Rome, Rome, and you count from, like... No, 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 we count, or... we count Eastern Empire. We, go, we count okay, from the Republic just, to, East, to, 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 to the fall of Byzantium, kind of. Okay, then you have, like, eight... 1800 and some years, might be 1900, See, depends a, on how you count it. He's a historian. I'm a philosopher. I talk about ethics in games. I talk about uh, the structure of power, especially as a GM, how to uh, exercise responsibilities and, that you have and to respect the trust that your players have, and how to manipulate that trust for fun and profit, which is why last month was Psychological Warfare Month, because there's a certain amount of storytelling and a certain amount of psychological warfare that goes into being a GM. Or in running a podcast, apparently. Look, I like tricking people into doing things. You bought into this. You you walked onto this camera. You can walk away anytime you want. It's not like I'm going to throw cards at you or something. Okay, I might throw cards at you, but not this one. This one's good. Um, I think it's good. 
Again, we have no idea. <laughs> no. I will also, in the future months, endeavor to learn more about magic. But I love magic cards because they're just this huge, random pile of fantasy ideas. And I do run a lot of fantasy. I run, I run a couple uh, modern games that run Spirit of the Century. Uh, I really want to get into Savage Worlds and some other contemporary stuff. But mostly d and is my game, especially right now, because soon... Whenever they manage to come out with 5th edition, D&D for charity. Stay tuned, it'll be here on this channel. So we're going to do this game one more time. And then we are going to sign off. I think so. Um, you started last time, so I think I have to start this time. That would only be fair. Alright, you can uh, shuffle and deal cards. I do not know how to shuffle. That's okay. So gonna I'm just going to keep doing this. I think I may have flipped a card. But no, no, that, that card is double-sided. There you go. All right, give me three cards. See what I can do. See what I got. I got. Okay. You're okay. We're gonna. Different. You're supposed to give that. me different cards. We're gonna, gonna mulligan, mulligan the riot control. One. All right. We're gonna mulligan that one too. I apparently suck at this. There we go. All right. So we got the Rakdos Drake. I love the art on these things too. That is actually really cool. The Orzov Clue Stone. Mulligan. Oh, is that that? That's the Crypt Incursion and a Knight. These are tokens. Tokens are super cool. I'm still learning about them as I as I play through. Um, most of the stories in Town Plane Modern Masters, which is a totally different set, so I'm just sort of learning about it. We've got the Rakdos Drake, the Orzov Clue Stone, and the Knight. And this is this is super easy. This is an encounter um, because the party, upon venturing to the Rakdov or the sorry the Orzov Clue Stone which is a set of standing stones not that far from town. They find a knight, a brave, vigilant knight, because all knight tokens come with vigilance, doing battle with a terrifying drake that thankfully is not a dragon. It's only about 10 feet tall, but it's the Rakdos Drake, and they know it from legends that have gone around the town. It lives in caves beneath the harbor, and it's a creature of blood and fury. Every three months, when the red moon comes, it soars out in search of fresh victims. But this brave knight, whose name is Harold, is determined to stop it. Is Hint, he a knight's Harold? No. You will permit me my little jokes. I suppose. He is determined to stop it. And he is losing when the party comes upon him. So it's up to them what to do. How about you? What do you got? Well, I don't think I'm going to completely reverse this because I think Drake at the end is a pretty good ending point. Yeah. But I think that first the party's going to come across a knight. Uh, he's not in battle. He's actually post battle. He's been hurt. Oh, okay. He's probably dying, uh, bleeding out on the road. Uh, his valiant steed is nuzzling him trying to get him to come back up so they can ride off and he can get some help but he doesn't seem like he can get up uh, and as the party approaches uh, they see that he's clutching something uh, and if uh, they know enough about the world and what's going on they know it's probably the uh, or Orzov. Or Orzov Clue Stone that's a tongue twister there but the Orzov Clue Stone uh, a sacred relic that is said to guide adventurers. Uh, just in general, it guides them. It doesn't actually seem to have a, uh, a broader goal or any real stated morals or anything. It just, it'll guide you to where your party wants to go. Uh, and... So it gives you a clue? It gives you a clue. It's well named. Occasionally oh. things are very well named. Yes. It was made by a guy named Orzov. Sure. Uh, and as they, uh, as the knight lays dying, they see within the clue stone the Rakdos Drake, who is uh, attacking a village. Uh, in fact, they're attacking the village of one of the party members. Oh, okay. I'm like, what would motivate me to go and fight a dragon that I saw in a rock? Other than vast hordes of treasure around said dragon. Which, Even then, I don't, I don't know that I mean, most points, like, if I had a choice between fighting a dragon and not, I would probably go with not. Vast hordes of treasure. I, you're really underestimating the mercenary nature of some parties. Fair enough, fair enough. 
but they see it attacking the village of one of the party members, and maybe they even see one of their loved ones fleeing before the drake, and just as a claw is about to crush around them, the image cuts out. Very nice, very nice. So yeah, we're gonna we're gonna play a bunch of different creativity games and things like that here. We're going to talk about whatever our theme is for this month. The theme for September is education. We're gonna talk about higher education specifically. So universities and colleges in fantasy worlds, in role playing, the kinds of things you could do with them. And then October will be scary month because October is Halloween and you do scary month and Halloween because that's how these things work. In November, I don't know, we live in Canada, so we're probably going to talk about how balls freezing cold it is. Which we would very much appreciate right now, as it is really the hot. Opposite. It's 40 degrees Celsius here. If you live in the States and you use Fahrenheit, that's like a million. Again, we don't know these things. So we're going to go and simmer to a low boil, and we will see you next month. Because I'd love you even if we were being chased by a horde of zombies. I'd never leave you behind.